History is filled with many dark and mysterious stories, from legends of witches and vampires, to accounts of evildoers and poisoners. In this video, we will cover all of this and more. We begin in late 15th century Italy, where rumours of debauchery and murder surrounded one woman and her family, owing to mysterious deaths of people close to them. Lucrezia Borgia was born on the 18th of April 1480, at Subiaco, which was then a town outside Rome, but which is a suburb of the Italian capital today. Her father was Rodrigo Borgia, a Spaniard who hailed from near Valencia originally, but who had headed to Rome in the mid-15th century, and her mother was Vanosa di Catanei, Rodrigo's chief mistress. In Rome, he quickly ascended through the ranks of the Roman Catholic Church under the patronage of his uncle Alfonso, who had been elected Pope Calixtus III in 1455. By the end of the 1450s, Rodrigo was a cardinal, a powerful office in what was an equally influential papal state, which controlled much of central Italy at the time, well beyond the Vatican. But Rodrigo was not exactly an average cardinal. He had many mistresses and sired several children, though this was not uncommon for churchmen at the time. There was great hypocrisy within the church during these years, as although the virtues of celibacy were preached, those in prominent positions blatantly ignored this in their clandestine private lives, and because of this, their behaviour became an object of some criticism amongst church reformers during the period. With Vanozza, Rodrigo had four children, and Lucrezia got along well with her siblings, especially her older brother Cesare. The two showed great affection towards each other, and Cesare would go on to play a prominent role in his sister's later life, but this strong bond would later lead to some dark rumours. As a daughter of one of the most prominent religious figures of the day, Lucrezia was afforded a very significant education in the new humanist learning which had been developed in Italy during the Renaissance period, and which focused on ancient Greek and Roman authors. She was tutored by Adriana Orsini of Milan. Through Orsini, Lucrezia learned several languages, and she was fluent in later life in Spanish, Catalan, French, Italian and Latin, while her humanist education would have included a solid grounding in Greek and Roman literature, rhetoric, politics, logic and philosophy, the core subjects of the humanist curriculum. Lucrezia was growing up during a tumultuous period in Italian history. Although Italy at this time was the centre of European civilization, with cities like Rome, Florence, Venice and Milan attracting the greatest artists of the day, politically, the peninsula was in a chaotic state. It was not united, but was divided into over two dozen large and small city-states, the foremost being the maritime trading republics of Genoa and Venice, several city-states in the north, such as the duchies of Milan, Ferrera and Urbino, Florence in Tuscany, which had the appearance of a republic, but which was actually ruled by the famous Medici family, and the papal state ruled from Rome in central Italy. In the south, the Kingdom of Naples and the island of Sicily were controlled by Spain. What was more, from 1494, a series of wars broke out, overseen by Spain and France, who were rivals for dominion in the Italian peninsula after France began trying to acquire influence in the north of the country. All of this was significant for Lucrezia, because her father organised several marriages for her which tried to strengthen the Borgia's position within this labyrinth political landscape. When she was just 10 years of age, Lucrezia's father promised her hand in marriage to a Valencian lord, but this and several other marital arrangements were called off in the years that followed as Rodrigo's political fortunes fluctuated in the early 1490s. His bargain in power changed dramatically in August 1492, when he won the contest to become the next Pope. As Pope Alexander VI, he was able to negotiate a far more favourable marriage alliance through Lucrezia. On the 12th of June 1493, she consequently married Giovanni Sforza, 
a member of the powerful Sforza family, which ruled the Duchy of Milan and several other small states in the north of Italy. This first marriage lasted only until 1497. By then, the Pope had decided that the alliance with the Sforzas was no longer the best option, and a better marriage alliance might be negotiated through Lucrezia, if the union was annulled. This was duly agreed to by Sforza after some pressure was applied, and he somewhat embarrassingly signed a document declaring that he could not consummate the marriage owing to being impotent, and this was sufficient grounds for annulment to be bestowed. Yet in response, it is believed that the humiliated Giovanni Sforza began to spread gossip, which claimed that Lucrezia engaged in sexual relations with her brothers and father. By now, Lucrezia was nearing her adult years, and rumours abounded that she was pregnant at the time of the annulment, owing to an illicit affair with a chamberlain who worked for her father by the name of Pedro Calderon. The events which followed are shadowy. Lucrezia disappeared from public for some time, and may have given birth to her first child by Calderon in the weeks that followed. Then, Calderon became a victim of the Borgia family's ruthlessness in dispensing with embarrassing problems. Well, he was found dead in the River Tiber, early in 1498. Her second husband, Alfonso of Aragon, was met with a similar bloody fate. Alfonso was a cousin of the Spanish royal family, having descended from the royal family of Aragon, the king of which was Ferdinand of Aragon, one of the two monarchs of Spain in the late 15th century along with his wife Isabella. Lucrezia's marriage to Alfonso in 1498 was part of her father's decision to temporarily back the Spanish in the Italian wars, but the marriage would only last as long as Pope Alexander's diplomatic realignment. Despite it being a good match, as both were the same age and were even said to have fallen deeply in love, in the year 1500, the Borgia decided to begin supporting France again. Thus, the Borgias needed Alfonso gone, and he quickly showed up dead as well in Rome. Lucrezia may have been complicit in his murder, though the marriage had already produced a son, named Rodrigo after his grandfather the Pope. Lucrezia's third and final marriage followed two years later. This was her most prominent marriage yet, and perhaps this is why it lasted. Her new husband was Alfonso d'Este, the son and heir of Ercole d'Este, the duke of the significant city-state of Ferrara in northern Italy. He would soon succeed his father and become duke himself in 1505. The marriage was celebrated in early 1502 and would last for the remainder of Lucrezia's life. It eventually resulted in several children, though the parentage of these may have been debatable, as Lucrezia, like her new husband, engaged in a string of affairs throughout the 1500s and 1510s. These included a long-standing relationship between Lucrezia and the Marquis of Mantua, Francesco Gonzaga, and a separate affair with the Renaissance composer and literary theorist Pietro Bembo, who was widely regarded as having formalised the dialect of Tuscan Italian, which subsequently became the standard version of the Italian language used throughout the peninsula. Lucrezia's family relations and her many affairs and marriages made her a focus of salacious gossip and many myths in the late 15th and early 16th century Italy. For starters, there were many rumours about illegitimate children which she had with her lovers, the first being Giovanni in early 1498, who is rumoured to have been the product of Lucrezia's ill-fated affair with Calderon, though Giovanni's parentage is still disputed. Additionally, accusations of an incestuous relationship with her brother, Cesare, abounded during her lifetime, particularly so after her second husband was murdered in Rome in 1500, and Cesare was widely suspected of having ordered the murder. It is though unlikely that this had anything to do with some bizarre lover's jealousy, but was rather owing to Cesare's political activities at the time. Lucrezia's brother, 
had acted as their father, the Pope's general, in extending the landed territory of the Papal State in central Italy during the late 1490s, and his decision to kill Alfonso of Aragon in 1500 was a purely political decision to do with the papacy's diplomatic realignment and alliance with France at this time. Lucrezia also developed the reputation of being a femme fatale herself, one who seduced men at will and who could poison them just as easily. She was rumoured, for instance, to wear a hollow ring which opened to allow her to pour poison into her unsuspecting victims' drinks. A notorious incident she was said to have been involved in was the Banquet of Chestnuts, a party thrown in Rome on the 30th of October, 1501. Here Lucrezia, her brother Cesare, and their father, Pope Alexander, were said to have been involved effectively in a borderline orgy involving some of Rome's nobility and dozens of the city's courtesans. There is only one account of the banquet by the master of ceremonies at the papal court of the time, Joan Bouchard, and it is now assumed that the story was possibly entirely invented to smear the Borgia family name. It is possible though that Lucrezia was neither a femme fatale or even particularly scandalous in her love life than any other aristocratic lady in late Renaissance Italy. There is no doubting that she was considered especially attractive by contemporaries, but her good looks need not necessarily have resulted in any particular sordid behaviour. Rather, she seems to have been stigmatised owing to her family's rather dubious actions in the 1490s and 1500s. Her father, the Pope, had several mistresses and encouraged his son to carve out his own kingdom in central Italy, using the resources of the Holy See of Rome to do so. And Cesare was the most notorious of Renaissance lords, who cast central Italy into chaos in the 1490s, and was reputedly a large influence on Niccolò Machiavelli when he set about writing his notorious political treatise, The Prince, some years later. Lucrezia's adult life was spent at the Este court in Ferrara, where her third husband became duke in 1505. As noted, she engaged in a string of affairs, though this was hardly unusual by the standards of late Renaissance Italy. This was complicated by one of her lovers, Francesco Gonzaga, having contracted syphilis around the time of, or shortly before their affair, a sexually transmitted disease which had arrived with devastating consequences to Europe in the late 15th century following European contact with the Americas. Though it is easily treated today with antibiotics, in the early modern period it slowly devastated the body, beginning with a rash around the genital region, then spreading further around the body and finally leading to deformities and often the collapse of parts of the body such as the nose if the disease lingered for months or years. Yet Lucrezia did not apparently contract the disease from Francesco, which women are less prone to. Her father, Pope Alexander, died in August 1503. He was a curious man who was a ruthless Renaissance prince that broke all of the rules associated with his office, but who was remembered fondly by some of the other popes of the time. With his position weakened following their father's death, Cesare began to lose control over some of the territories in central Italy, which he had conquered in the 1490s. He was eventually arrested by King Ferdinand of Aragon and transferred to Spain in 1504. He spent over 18 months in prison there before escaping and launching a revolt in the north of the country, which ended in his death in March 1507. Thus, within a few years in the 1500s, Lucrezia went from being the daughter of one of the most powerful families in Italy, to being an isolated figure descended from the fallen house of Borgia. She had at least eight children, the legitimacy of which was questionable, and perhaps as many as ten, depending on the parentage of two others. However, she also had several difficult conceptions and miscarriages during the 1500s and 1510s, and in the end, it was this turbulent natal history which led to her death. On the 14th of June 1519, 
she gave birth to a baby girl, who was christened Isabella. It had been another complicated pregnancy for Lucrezia, and this time, she never fully recovered. She fell ill after birth, and despite improving for a few days in the week that followed, she worsened and died on the 24th of June at the age of 39. She was buried in the church of Corpus Domini in Ferrara, the last major figure in the turbulent Borgia dynasty which had been so prominent in Italy since the mid-15th century. Lucrezia has been one of the most widely studied women of early modern Italy ever since her death. For instance, in 1833, the great French writer Victor Hugo scripted a stage play named after her, retelling a version of her life, while in the 20th and early 21st centuries, she is featured in numerous books, films, television series, and even a video game. In these, many of the rumours which surrounded her during her lifetime have featured prominently. For our next tale, we are staying in Italy, but going forward to the 1600s, where one woman was alleged to have poisoned over 600 people. Giulia Tofana appears to have been a Sicilian who was most likely born in the 1590s or 1600s. She came from a humble background and there is almost zero information available about her early life. Indeed, the first references to her do not appear until the early 1630s, by which time she was an adult. The only other ascertainable facts about her is that she seems to have been a native of the city of Palermo in Sicily, where she was living at the time of her first appearance on the historical record. It has often been conjectured that she was the daughter of Tofania da Damo, a belief which is based on the fact that many people in 17th century Italy took a parent's first name and used it as their surname. Thus, Tofania da Damo became Giulia Tofana. Yet there may well be no familial link between the two and observers may simply have been too eager to see a mother-daughter connection between two generations of Sicilian poisoners. What is relatively clear is that Giulia Tofana did work with and knew Tofania Dadamo in the early 1630s. On the 12th of July 1633, Tofania was executed in Palermo for having poisoned individuals with a concoction which a contemporary Italian diarist, Gaetano Alessi, called Aqua Tufania. Thus, the poison later known as Aqua Tofana might well have originated with Tofania Dadamo, but it is with Giulia Tofana and her notorious misdeeds in the 1630s and 1640s that it is generally associated. Exactly what the relationship between the two women was is unclear. Ancillary evidence indicates that Tofania Dadamo's main accomplice in Palermo, prior to being arrested, tried and executed, was one Francesca Lasarda, and she was arrested a year before Tofania was. However, it is also fairly clear that, while she was not mentioned in the trial proceedings or prosecuted in Palermo at this trial, Giulia Tofana was involved with Tofania and Lasarda as she was part of a group of women who quickly left Palermo in the aftermath of Tofania Dadamo's arrest and execution. These settled in Rome and were soon distributing their own version of Aqua Tofana. It is worth pausing at this point to consider what exactly Aqua Tofana is. While its exact chemical composition is not entirely clear, it appears to have principally consisted of a base of arsenic, antimony, and lead. Other accounts of the 17th century include the addition of corrosive sublimate, which was a contemporary term for mercuric chloride, a mixture of mercury and chlorine. This mixture of chemicals, if administered in a sufficient dose, will prove fatal in about three days. Records of the time indicate that the first symptoms which came on after being poisoned by Aquatofana, were a burning throat, followed by nausea, vomiting, extreme thirst, and diarrhea. 
The great attraction of Aquatofana as a poison is that arsenic is tasteless and was almost completely undetectable in the 17th century. In an age where the study of toxicology was relatively limited, nobody would know or could be sure that the victim had even been poisoned. Moreover, the early modern period was an age in which medicinal knowledge was still relatively lacking, and people often died quite suddenly from illnesses which could not be explained. As a result, Aquatofana could be used to poison somebody without much suspicion being aroused, but at the same time, its clandestine use of it makes it difficult for us to know exactly how widely the poison may have been used in the 17th century. Even some of the deaths which would come to be associated with Julia Tofana and her circle might well have been deaths from natural causes which were misattributed to her schemes. While Tofania de Damo and Francesca Lasarda may have been the first mass murderers to use Aqua Tofana, it has become more commonly associated with Giulia Tofana. Having arrived to Rome in 1633, Giulia quickly established herself as the leader of Dadamo and La Sarda's former accomplices. She recruited a younger woman by the name of Girolama Spara as her assistant, and some others who were more familiar with Rome and its politics and society. According to one source from the 1650s, they obtained a supply of arsenic to begin making Aquatofana from Father Girolamo of Sant'Agnese in Agone, a church in central Rome. His brother was an apothecary and had access to the poison. The pair then made the arsenic into a version of Aquatofana by mixing it into a liquid and bottling it in glass jars, which they then whimsically identified as Manna of St. Nicholas. The poison was then sold incognito as a liquid which allegedly removed facial blemishes. It is difficult to reassemble the exact details of who Tofana sold her poison to and what these same individuals were using it for. One generally doesn't go around advertising the details of who they are poisoning on a given day. However, details from the late 1650s during a trial of some of Tofana's own associates reveal some aspects of what occurred. Individuals from a varied range of Roman society were buying Aquatofana in the 1630s, 1640s and 1650s. Many of them came from the poor and middle classes of the city, but some were also highly connected within Roman society. For instance, the wife of the Duke of Cheri, a very high-ranking Roman noble, was said to have poisoned her husband. Aspects of the trials at this time were swept under the carpet to protect several socially prominent individuals in Rome and within the church from the scandal. The Duchess of Cherry's story was not uncommon. She appears to have purchased and used Aquatofana on her husband as a way of escaping from a loveless marriage to a much older man. It has been suggested that people such as her probably made up a substantial portion of Tofana's client base. In a society in which misogyny was the absolute norm, and domestic abuse was not uncommon, women had little way of challenging a drastically unhappy marriage through any legal means. As such, it is not surprising to learn that many women in early modern Italy turned to poisoners such as Giulia Tofana to help them get out of their difficult situation. The view that one of the primary uses of poisons such as Aqua Tofana in early modern times was for women to try and escape torrid marriages, is further suggested by the fact that the trade in poisons was usually dominated by women. Thus, the available records, fragmentary as they are, suggest that Tofana was selling much of her product to women looking to poison their husbands. The exact scale of her business is unclear. Some contemporary records suggest she may have been responsible in one fashion or another for poisoning up to 600 people. However, it can be hard to believe such figures. If 600 people had died in Rome and the surrounding region over a 20 year period with similar mysterious symptoms, it likely would have aroused grave suspicions. 
Nevertheless, Tolfana did have a competent circle working with her, and clearly a large clientele who kept her secrets safe and were satisfied with her product. Furthermore, the fact that the symptoms of the poison resembled that of an advancing disease meant that she could have easily been responsible for all these deaths without anyone catching on. Yet, it's likely that Tolfana and Spara did not just make their living from selling Aqua Tolfana. Research in recent decades has revealed that those who produced poisons in European cities at the time, such as Paris, Venice and Rome, operated in a kind of magical underworld, one which combined the manufacture and sale of poisons with other activities, such as the production of magical charms and objects, palm reading, astrology, and organising the occasional conventional murder by a contract killer. While records are fleeting, it is likely that Giulia Tolfana was also involved in activities of this kind. During the nearly 20 years she lived in Rome after relocating there from Palermo. The risks for Tofana were very considerable, while if she was caught, she would suffer grave consequences. Poisoning people in this way was considered a particularly heinous crime in early modern times, and extreme punishments were handed out to those who engaged in such activity. For instance, there are two competing accounts of how Tofania Dadama was executed after her conviction in 1633. Neither are pretty. In one, she was hanged, drawn and quartered, while the other suggests she was bound up alive inside a canvas sack and thrown from the roof of the bishop's palace in Palermo into the street far below. Luckily for her, Giulia Tofana would suffer no such fate. Unlike her mentors in Palermo, Tofania D'Adamo and Francesca Lasarda, Giulia Tofana was never convicted of any crime relating to her activities as a maker and distributor of poisons, and by most accounts, she died peacefully in bed in 1651. But other tales of her demise tell another story. One claims that she lived out the remainder of her years in a convent, using a network of nuns and clerics to continue her business while another account states that she was captured and executed, and others claim that she was strangled while living at the convent, yet it would seem that these are untrue. Her assistant, Girolamma Spara, succeeded her as head of the network of women who distributed Aquatelfana around Rome in the mid-17th century. Eventually, in 1658, her activities came to the attention of the authorities in Rome, and after standing trial, she and several other ringleaders were hanged in public in Rome, while dozens others who had aided them or been implicated in buying their poisons were sentenced to life in prison. The trials and subsequent events brought to light the extent of Tofana and Spara's clients and their positions within Roman society in the mid-17th century, with the aristocracy and even high-ranking churchmen implicated Aqua Tofana continued to be known of and used well beyond Giulia Tofana's time. The slow poison which she had devised had gained such notoriety by the early 18th century that Aqua Tofana became a catch-all term which was used throughout Western and Central Europe to refer to any kind of slow poison. Toxic potions of this kind were believed to be responsible for many kinds of sudden or inexplicable deaths. One infamous example of an individual who was believed to have been killed by Aqua Tofana, was the great Austrian composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He became ill in September 1791 and died just three months later, having become bedridden in his final weeks and suffering from pains, swelling and vomiting. The idea that he was dying from a slow poison originated from Mozart himself, who claimed, someone has given me Aqua Tofana and calculated the precise time of my death. There is no evidence to clearly indicate that he was poisoned, but at the same time, there is no consensus as to what actually caused his death, with scholars having suggested over a hundred different illnesses which might have been responsible. From rheumatic fever and trichinosis to influenza or kidney failure. However, 
it is possible that he died from some of the symptoms which Aquatofana would have induced, though in Mozart's instance, this was not owing to some malicious activity. Rather, mercury was used in many different common ways in society in the late 18th century, and a recent study has detected large amounts of arsenic on the manuscript of Die Zauberflut, the opera Mozart was working on at the time of his death. Thus, the Austrian composer might well have been the victim of some of the ingredients which Giulia Telfana placed in her slow poisons, but not of the poison itself. The notion of vampirism has existed for millennia, and vampiric entities have been recorded in cultures around the world. One such woman who was suspected of being a vampire by locals, owing to her strange behaviour, was Elena von Schwarzenberg. The woman who would one day become Eleanor von Schwarzenberg was born as Eleanor Elizabeth Amelia Magdalena on the 20th of June 1682 in the town of Melnik, in the region which was then known as Bohemia, but which today encapsulates the Czech Republic. Eleanor's father was Prince Ferdinand August of the House of Lobkowitz, a noble family of the region which could trace its roots back to the 14th century and which was accordingly one of the oldest and most respected aristocratic lineages in 17th and 18th century Bohemia. Ferdinand was also the second Duke of Sagan, his father, Vasclav Eusebius, having purchased this title and estate in 1646. Eleanor's early life is relatively unremarkable, and there is little documentary evidence concerning it. We can assume that she would have received a typical education for an aristocratic woman, in the late 17th century, with an emphasis on dancing and court etiquette, while she would most likely have learned some Latin, and almost certainly French, which was becoming the lingua franca of the aristocratic courts of Europe by this time. On the 7th of December 1701, when she was 19 years of age, Eleanor was married to Adam Franz Carl Eusebius, at the time the heir apparent to the princedom of Schwarzenberg, a major principality within the Archduchy of Austria. This was a major aristocratic title in Bohemia, well, the Schwarzenberg title stretched back to the High Middle Ages, and Adam would eventually succeed as the Prince of Schwarzenberg in 1703. His marriage to Eleanor, as with so many other aristocratic unions of the early modern period, was effectively a financial transaction and alliance. In such arrangements, the bride's father would typically provide a large dowry to the groom's father, hence one side would gain financially, but the bride's family would usually marry upwards in social status, if a substantial enough dowry could be provided. This was certainly the case with Eleanor, who although coming from an aristocratic family, was marrying into a more prestigious one. In return, Adam's father, Prince Ferdinand Wilhelm, was to receive a dowry of 20,000 guilders or gold coins, a huge sum. 3,000 guilders were to be paid up front, with the rest during instalments in the years to come. Eleanor and Adam's marriage was fraught with difficulties from its very inception. When the union was negotiated between their respective fathers, Adam had been in a relationship with the daughter of the Austrian ambassador to Rome, whom he had married in secret. In order to facilitate the marriage to Eleanor, Adam had been forced to quickly annul this secret marriage. This poisoned the relationship between Eleanor and her new husband right from the beginning. Also, things would not improve. Well, Eleanor did not become pregnant in the months and indeed years that followed. When a child did come, it was a girl named Maria Anna who arrived into the world in December 1706. Yet, no male heir to preserve the direct line of the Prince of Schwarzenberg appeared. As if these issues were not bad enough, the relationship between Eleanor and Adam was further complicated when Eleanor's father married Adam's sister, Maria Elizabeth. With this, Eleanor's father also became her brother-in-law, an unsettling arrangement. Moreover, friction arose after this as Ferdinand was failing to meet his dowry payments to Adam. On top of that, Eleanor miscarried during another pregnancy in 1709, and then accusations of infidelity arose against her. 
As a result of all of this, the couple spent much of the 1710s estranged from each other and living in separate residences. But reconciliation was eventually brought about in 1719. That year, Adam inherited an enormous estate in Bohemia following the death of his aunt. With this, the arguments over Eleanor's dowry suddenly became largely redundant, and the tensions between Adam and Eleanor's father had already ended when Ferdinand died in 1715. Then, in 1722, the elusive male heir Joseph Adam was born. Hence, after over 20 years of fractured and unhappy marriage, Adam and Eleanor's union finally seemed to be settling down. Life for the von Schwarzenbergs was relatively peaceful and uneventful during the 1720s, as they raised their young son. Throughout the 1720s, Adam had risen in the ranks of the Bohemian nobility, finding favour with the Archduke of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI, who also ruled as King of Bohemia with the regnal title of Charles II there. Under Charles, Adam had already been made Chamberlain of the Geheimrat, effectively Charles's advisory council or the government cabinet in the 1710s. Then in 1722, he was appointed to a senior position within the royal household in Vienna. Therefore, Adam and Eleanor spent much of their time during the 1720s at the imperial capital in Austria. Finally, Adam was made a member of the Order of the Golden Fleece, the senior chivalric order within the lands of the Archduchy of Austria. Given his senior position within the Austrian territories, it is hardly surprising to find that Adam was a regular hunting companion of Charles's, but it is altogether more surprising that this pastime cost Adam his life. On the 10th of June 1732, Adam joined Charles on a hunting trip at Brandeis, near Prague. It would prove to be a fateful decision. Later that day, Charles, who suffered from poor vision, shot Adam after mistaking him for a deer, though other accounts claimed he just happened to be in the line of fire. Adam died the following day from his wounds. Following his death, Archduke Charles, no doubt driven by guilt at having killed his longtime friend and advisor, took Eleanor's son Joseph under his wing, and bestowed a large pension on Eleanor. Thereafter, she spent her remaining years managing the von Schwarzenberg estate. Sadly for the princess, in the late 1730s her health began to rapidly deteriorate. At the time, it is said that she became extremely skinny and weak, and as medical interventions were still very primitive, Eleanor turned to folk remedies to try and cure her ailments. These included the use of narwhal horn, the task of an arctic whale which was referred to as a unicorn horn in early modern Europe, and which was more valuable than gold by weight, owing to belief in its medicinal properties. Though we now know that the use of narwhal horn would not have been in any way beneficial in curing her condition. During this time, her condition continued to worsen, hardly being able to eat, drink or sleep, only resting at certain times during the day. Also, claims surrounding her life state that she was extremely pale and because of her illness, began to employ various witches, alchemists and others with strange appearances in hopes that she could improve. Because of this, as well as the fact that Charles had accidentally killed her husband, he decided to send Eleanor one of his best doctors. The doctor eventually arrived at the Schwarzenberg estate, apparently claiming that she looked like a walking corpse, and that her room was constantly shaded as sunlight disturbed her. It was subsequently claimed that Eleanor also kept caged wolves in the basement of her estate, and she had spent years drinking their milk to improve her fertility, though it seems that these rumours are unfounded. With the passage of time, Eleanor continued to worsen and was in immense pain. Apparently, her screams became a fairly frequent occurrence at her palace, terrifying all who heard them. Finally, after years of suffering, she eventually died at the Palais Schwarzenberg in Vienna on the 5th of May 1741 at the age of 58. Following her death, an autopsy was performed 
and it confirmed that she has what we now know as cervical cancer. She was also suffering from several tumours, one of which was larger than a tennis ball. Before she died, she asked that her heart be buried next to her husband, while her body was buried in the church of St. Vitus Chesky Krumlov in the Czech Republic. At the time, fear of vampires was very much a real thing, so much so that local townspeople began disinterring the bodies of the recently deceased, chopping off their heads, afraid that they may be vampires. Meanwhile, some had stakes driven through them and others were burnt. Legend has it that some locals were convinced that the princess had become a vampire and that she was seen walking through the nearby towns and cemeteries after her death, while other more far-fetched tales claim that she was seen biting the corpses of the recently deceased, sucking out their blood. For years after this, stories of vampires continued to circulate in the region, and supposedly, for some time her name was considered damned, but eventually, these tales faded into myth, and these rumours were forgotten. Yet, due to the strange circumstances surrounding the end of her life, as well as Eleanor's medical history, it may be possible that some townsfolk actually believed her to be a vampire, or in some way related to the occult, yet there is little concrete evidence from the time to confirm this. The legends surrounding her life are many, and it can be hard to separate the fact from the fiction. But despite this, in recent years she has been labelled as a vampire princess. But why? In 2007, Eleanor was the subject of a major investigative documentary which premiered on Austrian television entitled The Vampire Princessin, or The Vampire Princess in English. This documentary speculated that Eleanor had engaged in vampirism and was the inspiration for Dracula, the great gothic horror novel written by the Irish Victorian novelist Bram Stoker, and published in 1897. The belief that Eleanor might have been the basis for Bram Stoker's magnum opus certainly has some arguments in its favour. For example, Dracula once had an alternative first chapter to that which was eventually published in 1897. This earlier draft version indicates that Stoker was actually inspired not by a man, but a woman. Moreover, this woman was a princess of the Austrian state, and references in the manuscript version refer to the region in the modern day Czech Republic where Eleanor would have lived in the first half of the 18th century. In addition to this, it was claimed that Eleanor had earlier been the inspiration for a poem entitled Lenore, written in 1773 and published the following year by the German author Gottfried August Berger. This was a gothic ballad which, while not really featuring a typical vampire, had elements of vampirism in it and is seen as having been a major early influence in the development of vampire literature. The poem is set in Bohemia around the von Schwarzenberg estate, and the titling of Berger's poem as Lenore, an abbreviated version of Eleanor, led the documentarians in 2007 to claim that Eleanor had been the basis for Berger's work in addition to Bram Stoker's over a hundred years later. Yet, these attributions are quite circumstantial, as was the other evidence presented in the documentary The Vampire Princess. For instance, it was claimed that the folk remedies Eleanor utilised to try and cure her ailments were indicative of a form of occultism, but in pre-modern times, such folk remedies were very widely used throughout Europe. But perhaps the most interesting piece of evidence presented by the documentarians to assert that Eleanor had dabbled in vampirism and had consequently been the inspiration for both Berger's and Stoker's works concerned the von Schwarzenberg's family crypt in the town of Chesky Krumlov in the south of Bohemia. Here, both Eleanor and her husband Adam had been buried in the church of St. Vitus, but Eleanor's heart was removed and placed in an urn which was then interred in a small cellar on the left side of the chapel next to Adam's heart. Today, a plaque over the cellar reads, Here are stored the hearts of Adam and his wife Eleonora, princes of Schwarzenberg 
and Dukes of Krumlov. By modern sensibilities, this is perhaps a strange case. Modern funerary and burial traditions do not generally have people removing the hearts of the deceased and interring them separate to their bodies, and the makers of Die Vampire Prinzessin were very anxious to stress that this was indicative of some form of occultism on Eleanor's part. Yet, by the standards of 18th century Central Europe, there was nothing too uncommon about this. Indeed, the royal family, the Habsburgs of Austria, had a similar tomb constructed in Vienna, in which the hearts of senior members of the family were interred separate to their bodies. As such, there is little concrete evidence to corroborate the argument that Princess Eleanor von Schwarzenberg was someone who engaged in vampirism and was accordingly the inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. Thus, the legends regarding her life, referring to Eleanor as a vampire princess, despite being fascinating, are likely nothing more than that, legends. For our next tale, we are going to early 19th century Germany, where a wealthy couple moved into a secluded castle and were never seen again. The mystery of the Dunkelgrafen begins on the 7th of February, 1807. That day, a covered carriage arrived at the town of Hildeberghausen in Thuringia in central Germany. When it arrived, a couple got out. The man was in his late thirties at the time, but the woman was some years younger, perhaps nearing her thirtieth year, or so observers would have estimated at the time. Who were they? Many in the town asked. But in the years that followed, virtually nothing was uncovered, and instead, the mystery simply deepened. The mysterious couple took up residence in a modest dwelling in Hildberghausen over the next three years. He went by the title and name of Count Vavil de Versailles, while pains were taken to never reveal her identity. There was little explanation about who they were and where they had come from. Most curiously, why were a count and his female companion, whom he stressed was not his wife or partner of any kind, relocate into the remote Hildeberghausen? Were they perhaps hiding from something, or from someone? In 1810, the couple moved into Eishausen Castle, near the town, but in a secluded region. And when they did, they largely remained there. They rarely, if ever, left the castle, and lived a kind of self-imposed exile outside Hildeberghausen. On those rare occasions when they did leave Eishausen, the woman in particular was elusive, usually riding wherever she needed to go in a carriage and with a veil covering her face. This went on for a long time, and the villagers of Hildeberghausen and the surrounding region soon began to refer to the couple as the Dunkelgrafen, or Dark Counts on account of the shadowy nature of their identity. After decades of reclusion in Eishausen Castle, she eventually died on the 28th of November, 1837, while the supposed Count lived a further eight years until 1845. At the time of her death, the woman was recorded as Sophie Botter, and she was buried on Schulersberg Hill, near the castle in a garden which the couple had purchased several years earlier. The Count was laid to rest in the churchyard of Eishausen, while the castle was torn down in 1873 after lying vacant for some years. This was all very peculiar. The couple had died having lived in the region under strange circumstances for upwards of 40 years in the case of the Count. Thus, even years after their deaths, the residents of Hildeberghausen continued to wonder who the strangers who had lived in their midst for so many years had been, and one theory above all became popular. Following the Count's death in 1845, it was soon revealed that the man had actually not been a Count at all. Rather, he was a Dutchman by the name of Leonardus Cornelius van der Valk, who had acted as a secretary in the Dutch Embassy in Paris between the summer of 1798 and the spring of 1799. So why had he lied, and pretended to be a minor aristocrat? Also, if he wasn't a count, but rather a humble bureaucrat, 
How would he and his female companion have been able to purchase a castle and live there without working or earning an income for decades? The answer many people increasingly believed was that the man was a lifelong chaperone of sorts for none other than Marie-Thérèse Charlotte, the daughter of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette of France, both of whom had been killed by the French Revolutionary Government back in 1793 following the French Revolution. Let's backtrack to consider who Marie-Thérèse was. She was born at the Palace of Versailles outside Paris on the 19th of December 1778, the eldest child of King Louis XVI and his Austrian-born queen, Marie Antoinette. Marie-Thérèse was the only one of her parents' three children who would survive into adulthood. She had two younger brothers, Louis-Joseph born in 1781 and Louis-Charles born in 1785 both of whom succumbed to tuberculosis when they were seven and ten years of age respectively, though Louis Charles's death may have been accelerated by inhumane treatment at the hands of the revolutionary government in Paris in the early 1790s. In 1789, the French Revolution broke out across France. By the end of the year, Marie-Thérèse and her parents were being held under house arrest in Paris by the revolutionaries. For a time, Louis and Marie were allowed to remain as king and queen of the country as figureheads, but when they continued to conspire with foreign governments to have Austria, Britain and other countries intervene in France on their behalf, the French government eventually decided to place the monarch and his consort on trial. Both were found guilty of treason and executed in the course of 1793. With the death of her little brother two years later, Marie-Thérèse was the last member of the family alive. By 1795, the former princess was deemed to pose little threat to the revolutionary government. The monarchy had been brought to an end, a republic had been established, and the French revolutionary armies had gone from being on the defensive against the British, Austrians and others, to being on the offensive. Conquering the Low Countries early that year, and establishing the Batavian Republic there as a close ally. Consequently, the possibility of Marie-Thérèse being used by the foreign powers as a figurehead to re-establish the monarchy seemed remote, and she was allowed to leave France and head to her mother's family in Vienna in Austria. And here is where the plot thickens. Marie-Thérèse was incredibly traumatised by the years she had spent in captivity. There is no denying that. As a result, some people came to believe that the woman who arrived to Vienna in 1795, claiming to be Marie-Thérèse, was in fact her foster sister. This woman was Ernestine de Lombriquet, a child of two royal servants who had worked at the Palace of Versailles in the 1770s and 1780s. Ernestine bore a resemblance to the royal children, and rumours abounded that King Louis was her actual father. Whatever the truth of this, she became a playmate of Marie-Thérèse, and when her mother died in 1788, the king and queen adopted her, although her father was still alive. During the tumultuous years which followed, Ernestine was not held captive with the rest of the royal family, but she was often mistaken for being Marie-Thérèse, and was insulted as she walked the streets of Paris. Such was the resemblance between her and the king and queen's biological daughter. And it was this resemblance which led many people to believe that when Marie-Thérèse allegedly arrived to Vienna in 1795, it was actually Ernestine de Lombriquet pretending to be Marie-Thérèse. This theory suggests that Marie-Thérèse was so traumatised by the events of the years between 1789 and 1795, that when she was released, she simply wanted to spend her life in isolation, away from court circles and governments elsewhere, who would only try to use her as a pawn in the wars as the British, Austrians and others remained in conflict with France for much of the period down to 1815. Consequently, the theory of the Dunkelgrafen holds that the woman who was travelling around Europe's courts for decades after 1795 pretending to be Marie-Thérèse was actually Ernestine de Lombriquet, while the woman who pulled up in a carriage to Hildberghausen in the spring of 1807 and became known as the Dark Countess, was actually the French princess, who had been in hiding away from the world, which had left her soul traumatised. 
For many years, the mystery continued to deepen. Research was conducted by many historians and hobbyists into the mysterious Dark Countess and the Dunkelgrafen. Much of this added to the speculation. For instance, it was revealed that the Austrian court had specifically requested that Agnestine de Lombriquet, Marie Therese's childhood friend and companion, should be allowed to travel with her to Vienna in 1795. But at this time, it was reported back that Agnestine could not be located. Perhaps many speculated this was because Agnestine was now in Paris, pretending to be Marie Therese, and ready to head to Vienna as such. Additionally, research into the party of individuals who were believed to have travelled across Europe from Paris to Vienna with Marie Therese in 1795 uncovered some highly unusual anomalies. Several members of the small party could not be identified, and some of them were said to have never reached Vienna. These curious circumstances did not prove anything, but they did serve to add further uncertainty to the surrounding events. Eventually, the speculation led to concerted efforts to uncover the truth, and modern science has created the possibility of being able to finally decipher the mystery of the Dungelgrafen. Thus, in 2013, the grave of Sophie Botta, the Dark Countess, was excavated near Eishausen Castle. After her remains were exhumed, two small sections of her femur were sent to forensic labs in Austria and Germany to be analysed. Once this was done, the mitochondrial DNA was then assessed with that of Prince Alexander of saxe gasafi a contemporary descendant of Queen Marie Antoinette. If the Dark Countess was Marie Therese, then Prince Alexander's mitochondrial DNA would be an exact match with that found in the remains located in Sophie Botter's grave next to Eishausen Castle. Unfortunately, the result proved immensely disappointing for many. It was discovered that the Dark Countess was not a relative of Queen Marie Antoinette, and so she couldn't have been Marie Therese. Therefore, the mysterious couple who arrived to Hildeburghausen in 1807 and lived there for over 30 years down to their deaths were probably exactly what they most obviously appeared to have been, an independently wealthy couple of individuals who wanted to live a reclusive life in a castle in rural Germany. Throughout history there are countless stories of witchcraft and the harm or misfortune associated with it. One such tale is that of the White Witch of Rose Hall. The woman who later became known as the White Witch of Rose Hall was born as Annie Patterson somewhere in Britain in 1802 to an English mother and an Irish father. Her exact birthplace is unclear and some accounts suggest she was born in Scotland. Annie's family soon moved to Haiti when Annie was around 9 or 10 years of age. At that time, a part of the island of Hispaniola, which had experienced extreme political and social unrest in the 1790s and 1800s, largely owing to its origins as a French sugar colony, which could not be controlled from Paris during the French Revolutionary Wars and Napoleonic Wars which followed. Shortly after the arrival of the family in Haiti, Annie's parents died from yellow fever, a tropical disease with symptoms similar to jaundice. Thereafter, Annie was allegedly raised by her nanny, who was a voodoo priestess at a time when Haiti was a central home of voodoo. However, just over six or seven years later, Annie was again struck by loss when this nanny died, leaving her essentially fully orphaned in a Caribbean world, which was so different to Britain where she had spent her first ten years. It was in these circumstances that Annie Patterson set off for Jamaica. Unlike Haiti, which was originally settled as a French colony, Jamaica had been under English control since the mid-17th century, when the Cromwellian government conquered it from the Spanish. As such, Patterson, as an English-born woman, might have decided that she would be more at home here. Jamaica, like elsewhere in the Caribbean, was settled along slave plantation lines, generally with a small minority of European colonists who ran large-scale plantations producing cash crops, principally sugar, and based on the labour of large numbers of enslaved people. Yet at the time, Annie would have had no clue 
that her move to Jamaica in the long run would lead to the creation of the infamous tale of the White Witch, and it was all intimately associated with the manor of Rolls Hall. The manor of Rolls Hall had been built during the 1770s by a senior member of the colonial community in Jamaica, John Palmer, at the same time that Jamaica was flooding in colonial money and many rich and lavish plantation houses were emerging. It was erected on the site of an earlier colonial residence, one which had previously been known as Rolls Hall, after the mistress of the household, Rosa Kelly. The house is a vast estate, and is considered by many observers to be the finest plantation or colonial manor house ever built on the island of Jamaica during the early modern period. Rosa Kelly subsequently became John Palmer's wife, the latest of multiple nuptials for both Rosa and John. It should be noted here that there is no suspicion that either John Palmer or Rosa Kelly were murdered, an important point given the later allegations against Annie Palmer. Rosa herself died in 1790 and John Palmer passed away seven years later in 1797, a further wife which John had taken in the early 1790s after Rosa's death, subsequently returned to England and lived a long life there until the mid-1840s. Thus, these individuals had died or left Jamaica years, even decades before Annie Patterson ever arrived there. The wider Palmer family were in general back in England and lived a comfortable life there on the back of the profits gleaned from their Jamaican plantation. However, one member of the dynasty, John Rose Palmer, a nephew of John Palmer Sr. and Rosa, elected to live on and manage the estate in Jamaica, following their deaths in the 1790s. He was still there in 1818 when Annie Patterson arrived to the island. They soon met and married. Thus, Annie Patterson became Annie Palmer and became the mistress of Rolls Hall, a large plantation estate. And with this, the myth of the White Witch would soon follow. According to legend, Annie is believed to have employed magic from the very early beginnings of her arrival in Jamaica. For instance, it is suggested, according to certain myths about her life, that when she met John Palmer and realised that he was the owner of a large plantation estate, she cast a spell on him in order to entrance him into marrying her. So, the first part of the myth of the White Witch is that Annie Patterson became the mistress of Rose Hall and Annie Palmer by invoking magic against John Palmer. Then, having married John and inveigled her way to a position of prominence at Rose Hall, Annie is believed to have quickly conspired to dispense with her new husband entirely in order to obtain sole control over Rose Hall. Shortly after they were wed and had settled down to married life at the manor, Annie is believed to have poisoned John and killed him in order to obtain control of the plantation. Other spurious accounts suggest she poisoned extended members of the Palmer family as well at this time, many of whom, as we previously saw, had been deceased due to natural causes for years, in some cases as much as 20 or more years. Not long after this, it is believed that Annie married again, this time to an English planter whom it is rumoured that she also killed in quick succession this time by stabbing him to death. A third marriage is believed to have developed and ended similarly in the months or years that followed. On this occasion, the White Witch is alleged to have used one of the enslaved men on the plantation to strangle this most recent husband to death. In both instances, it is supposed in different accounts of her life that Annie profited from killing these subsequent husbands. In the same way, she had become the sole mistress of Rose Hall by murdering John Palmer. In the years after she took over, Annie is alleged to have ruled the plantation in a heavy-handed and indeed sadistic fashion. She was said to have whipped the enslaved people there and tortured them, even putting some to death. Moreover, elements of her past years in Haiti were incorporated into the story, some accounts for instance suggesting that Annie engaged in voodoo practices, which were both then as now intimately associated with Haiti. Perhaps most graphically, Annie was said to have had the basement of Rose Hall refurbished and turned into a dungeon of sorts 
where she would carry out her acts of torture. Most savagely, it was even rumoured that the White Witch had murdered the children of some of the enslaved plantation workers at Rose Hall and then harvested their bones for use as a species of compound in her black magic spells. While there are many myths and varying stories about Annie's behaviour, most agree that the White Witch finally met her demise when she ended up in a conflict with a former enslaved man named Taku, whom she had previously taken as a lover. Palma is said to have murdered one of Taku's relatives, and he is then supposed to have killed her in retaliation, using a mix of black magic and physical force. Another version of events is less dramatic, and simply asserts that Taku became angered with the White Witch as a result of her having taken another lover from amongst the other enslaved workers, and consequently, Taku simply strangled her in her sleep. A third version of the story states that it was Taku's son-in-law who was involved in her murder. But the tale doesn't end there. Various versions claim that in the months and years following her death, Annie's spirit continued to roam the manor and grounds of Rose Hall, terrorising the slaves and servants whom she now sought to punish for having failed to protect her in life. This was despite the fact that the enslaved plantation workers had conducted a voodoo ritual to try and ensure that she could not strike at them from beyond the grave. Such tales persisted for decades, and implied that, for years after her death, the spirit of Palma continued to roam and haunt the manor of Rolls Hall on Jamaica. Thus, the Killer White Witch was now a ghostly entity, possibly seeking revenge even after death. So, could any of this myth of the White Witch have any basis at all in reality? The answer is largely no. In reality, Annie Palmer and John Palmer left Rose Hall shortly after they were married, around 1820. Despite the grandeur of the manor, the estate had run into massive financial problems in the early 19th century, as slavery was gradually prohibited and then banned entirely throughout Britain's colonial possessions. As this occurred, John Palmer eventually ended up passing ownership of the manor of Rose Hall to his creditors, and he and Annie left the estate entirely. Not a lot is known about what they did thereafter. While the manor of Rose Hall was actually abandoned for about 130 years, until it was re-edified and reoccupied during the mid 20th century. This raises the question as to why the myth of the White Witch emerged to begin with, and there is a relatively direct answer to this question. In 1868, a story was published about the first owner of Rose Hall, Rose Palmer, who lived decades before Annie Palmer ever arrived on the scene. Like the myth of Annie, Rose Palmer had multiple husbands and had been largely in charge of Rose Hall. Over the years that followed, additional details were added which subsequently furthered the myth of the White Witch. Most significant in this regard was a book on local Jamaican history which was published in 1911, and a novel in 1929 which complemented the myth of the White Witch. In the latter instance, a century had passed since the time of Palmer's supposed misdeeds, and there was nobody left around to argue against these untruths. Thus, the book which was published in 1929 as a work of fiction, and was not meant to be interpreted as a piece of accurate historical reportage, entered into the record as a piece of pseudo-history. Nevertheless, while the true story of Annie Palmer is well known today, many people in Jamaica still consider Rose Hall to be a haunted house, and there are numerous stories of the manor house being haunted by a figure dressed in green velvet, early 19th century clothing, haunting the lands of the manor and plantation. In other versions, a woman in white wanders around the house, while further accounts still record how screams can regularly be heard from Rose Hall at night, especially in the basement which Annie is said to have converted into a dungeon, but which today is a gift shop at what has become a tourist site. Thus, while the myth of Annie Palmer and the White Witch of Rose Hall have been dismissed as nothing more than a tale, residual elements of the Jamaican horror story continue to be believed today and it would seem with good reason. For our final story, we are going to the late 19th century 
where one man became obsessed with a tuberculosis patient, even after her death. Karl Tanzler, who later listed his own name as Count Tanzler von Kolsel in the United States, was born in the German city of Dresden on the 8th of February, 1877. Little is known about his early life, but evidently, he had a lengthy education and qualified as a medical doctor at some time in the 20th century. Thereafter, he left Germany and travelled to Australia, where he lived fairly peacefully for the better part of a decade. One account on his life gives us a better insight into his time in Australia. It states that, many years ago, Carl von Kolsal travelled from India to Australia with the intention of proceeding to the South Seas Islands. He paused in Australia to collect equipment and suitable boats and to become acquainted with prevailing weather and sea conditions. However, he became interested in engineering and electrical work there, bought property, boats, an organ, an island in the Pacific, so that he was still in Australia at the end of 10 years. In 1914, Tanzler had been working to build a transocean flyer. However, as the First World War had broken out, and being a German citizen in one of the ANZAC countries, which stands for Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, he was detained and placed in an internment camp for some time during the long-running conflict. After this, he was removed to Trial Bay, a castle-like prison on the cliffs, and there he continued his work. Once the war had ended in 1918, the Australian government took the decision that anyone who had been detained during the conflict as a foreign prisoner should not be allowed to stay, and so in the late 1910s, he found himself being forcibly extradited from Australia back to Europe, where he arrived to Holland. From Holland, Tanzler made his way back to Germany, and he searched for his mother, whom he had not heard from since the beginning of the war. Gladly, she was safe and well, and Tanzler remained with her for three years, witnessing the chaos and tragedy that followed in the wake of the Great War. Then he soon married Doris Schaffer. Together they would have two children, Ayesha born in 1922, and Clarista who arrived two years later in 1924. However, Tanzler saw little prospects for himself and his new family in post-war Europe. He had also been in communication with his sister, who was living in Florida in the southeast of the United States. Convinced by her of the opportunities offered in the sunnier climes of America, the Tanzlers emigrated in 1926. They first sailed to the Havana in Cuba, and then went on to Florida, where they settled in Zemfri Hills. Curiously, it was when he first arrived in the United States that Carl first used the name Count Tanzler, telling a story that he was a relative of the Countess of Kolsal, an 18th century lover of the King of Poland, Augustus the Strong, whose ghost apparently visited him regularly during his childhood. According to Tanzler, during these visitations, he was confronted by visions of a face of a dark-haired woman that would one day become the love of his life. Shortly after they arrived to Zephyr Hills, Carl left his family there in order to take up a position as an x-ray technician at the Marine Hospital in Key West, in the south of Florida. Little is known about his work here during the first few years, yet this would change due to the arrival of a certain patient with which his name has become synonymous. On the 22nd of April 1930, Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos, a Cuban-American woman, entered the hospital. She was the daughter of a cigar maker and a homemaker, and had been raised in a large family. On this particular day, her mother had brought her to the hospital as she had been feeling ill for some time. Tanzler was apparently struck by her from the moment she entered his clinic, as the young woman bore a striking resemblance to the apparition of the woman he claimed had visited him ever since his childhood, and was allegedly meant to be his one true love. Tanzler was transfixed by her immediately, but the young woman's diagnosis upon her medical examination 
was troubling. Elena was suffering from tuberculosis, an infectious disease caused by bacteria, and for which there were few effective medications or treatments available in the early 20th century, making it typically fatal at the time. Moreover, Elena's cause was probably not aided by Tanzler himself in the months that followed. He had no particular training in how to deal with infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis, but his obsession made him determined to try and save her life. As a result, instead of turning her care over to someone more suitably trained, he saw to it himself, and developed a series of specially devised tonics and medications to try and treat her condition. His obsession with her was also exhibited in the presentation of regular gifts to her of jewellery, clothing and other items, as well as expressions of his love, though there is nothing to indicate that she reciprocated these feelings in any way. Eventually, Elena died a year and a half later, on the 25th of October 1931. Indeed, the disease and its contagious qualities, as well as its lethality, ensured that several of her family and extended family also died from it in the years that followed. An alternative theory though, is that Tanzler, in an effort to ensure that he would not lose contact with the woman he became obsessed with, actually poisoned her gradually, using a solution composed of the root of wolfsbane and aconite diluted. The evidence for this theory is questionable however, and it seems most likely, given the fate of her other family members, that Elena did simply pass away owing to her tuberculosis. But while Elena was dead, Tanzler's obsession was not. In the aftermath of her death, he had agreed to pay for Elena's funeral and burial in Key West. He spent elaborately on this in order to provide a raised tomb in a cemetery, and for the next two and a half years, he would visit here nearly every evening. However, it would soon all become even more obsessive. One evening in April 1933, the doctor made his usual trip up to Key West Cemetery to visit Elena's mausoleum. Tanzler had paid for her expensive tomb, but one of the things that this had involved was him having a key to the tomb itself. He was clearly not in the best of psychological states by the spring of 1933. He later claimed that Elena's ghost had been appearing to him regularly during his visitations there in the early 1930s. Moreover, he had recently lost his job at the clinic in Key West under unknown circumstances. Additionally, he had recently gone some time without visiting Elena's tomb, and the reason was that he had been planning something quite dramatic. On this evening, in April 1933, he removed her decaying body from the tomb and placed it in a toy wagon which he had brought with him, and then he took it home with him. Once there, Dr. Tansler was confronted with the macabre problem of a partially decayed corpse. This he began to remedy by attaching some of the disconnected bones together with piano wire and other materials. He fitted glass eyes into her eye sockets to act as a replacement for her natural eyes, which had decomposed by this time. And as the days and weeks passed, and further parts of Elena's body decomposed, he replaced parts of her skin with a mixture of silk cloth hardened with an outer layer of wax and some plaster of Paris that would be used for making casts. Tansler even went so far as to start fashioning a wig for the body as the hair continued to fall away from her skull. Some of this hair came from Elena's mother, which Tansler had obtained and kept. Most bizarrely, he filled her stomach and chest cavity with cloth and other textiles to preserve the impression of a normal human form, and he even dressed the body. Most shockingly, he then used various disinfectants and preserving agents to make the corpse somewhat hygienic, and splashed perfume on it to mask the odour of decomposition. These preservation methods were carried out in an old aeroplane near his house, which the doctor had repurposed as a makeshift medical lab. Now, here is where things get even stranger. Over the next seven years, 
Carl Tanzler slept in his bed with the corpse of Maria Elena de Hoyos. But rumours were circulating around Key West as well. Rumours about the strange reclusive man who was often spotted buying women's clothes and perfume around town. There was even one story of a local youth who had seen the doctor dancing in his house with what appeared to be a giant doll. Eventually, the De Hoyos family heard these rumours and believed that there must be something to them. One day, Maria Elena's sister, Florinda, heard further rumours of the doctor who had treated his sister ten years earlier and who had insisted on paying for the tomb to which only he had a key. All of this made the rumour that Tanzler was sleeping with a corpse at night all the more believable. Thus, she travelled to Tanzler's home and confronted him in October 1940. Having entered the house, she saw what she believed at the time was a life-sized effigy of her sister that Tanzler had made. Afterwards, she alerted the authorities and it was only later when they intervened and entered Tanzler's house that it became clear that this was actually the heavily doctored body of her deceased sister. As a consequence, Tanzler was quickly arrested and was charged for what under the circumstances was the most obvious crime he was guilty of, grave robbing. Tanzler was now to be tried for grave robbing, even as an autopsy was carried out on Maria Elena's corpse to see exactly what he had done. Suspicions that he had engaged in necrophilia were raised, but it could not be proved and under questioning, Tanzler did not admit to doing such. Eventually, once this process was complete, her body was returned to Key West Cemetery where it was buried in an unmarked grave to prevent any further interference with her resting place by Tanzler or anybody else, as the story had gained some notoriety by this time in South Florida. A psychiatric evaluation of Tanzler followed. This determined that he was mentally competent to stand trial on the charge of grave robbing, but the case soon collapsed as it was argued that the particular charge fell outside the statute of limitations, as it had occurred over seven years earlier, and since no further charges were to be brought, Tanzler was effectively made a free man. Curiously, throughout all of this, Tanzler became a subject of some sympathy in media reportage of the event, a result of his actions being construed as those of a hopeless romantic. Following the collapse of the trial and the reburial of the Oyos' body, Tanzler moved back to Pasco County in Florida near Zephyr Hills, where he had left his family back in the mid-1920s, shortly after arriving to the United States. Surprisingly, despite his abandonment of them and his rather questionable behaviour in the interim period, Tanzler was given some financial and material support from his estranged wife. The last years of the self-proclaimed Count's life were equally peculiar. Having been separated completely from Elena's corpse, he is alleged to have constructed a life-sized effigy to act as a replacement, one which he lived with until his death on the 3rd of July 1952, at the age of 75. This was replete with a wax death mask. His body was only discovered three weeks later in his home, by some accounts, lying next to the effigy he had constructed of the woman who became his obsession. Unsurprisingly, given the strange nature of his life and obsession, Tanzler and the Oyos' story has been retold many times in the years since, most notably a HBO documentary in 1999, while a display highlighting the story has been introduced to the Martello Gallery Key West Art and Historical Museum. Thank you everyone for watching this compilation style video on these dark historical tales. I hope you found it interesting. If you have any other suggestions, be sure to leave them down below in the comments. And I hope you guys have notifications turned on and are subscribed to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me. So I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.